الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلم تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters, today I am going to talk to you about the greatest ayah in the Holy Quran. If someone were to ask you what is our greatest possession as human beings, what is it that we as human beings possess the most, perhaps I, I can come up with one, so I had to think of two or three things. I would say that three things that are probably the most precious to humanity, one is obviously our life. Without life we are nothing. Number two is this intrinsic, this hard wiring inside human beings which gives us the capacity to yearn, to recognize, to connect and to serve with Allah subhanahu wa This is something that is hard wiring us. To yearn for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to recognize our Creator, to connect with Him, to worship Him, and to serve Him. And the third most important thing that we possess as human beings is the Word of God in this world with us in the Quran. So which is the greatest of ayahs in the Quran? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Allahu la ilaha illa huwa la yul qayyum la ta'khuduhu sinatum wa la naum لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ إِنَّهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِنْ عِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَاءَ وَسِيعَ كُرْسِيُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَا يَئُودُهُ حِفْظُهُمَا وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this is the greatest ayah in the Quran he speaks to Allah's perfection, to his omniscience, to his existential independence, and to his unaccountability. One way of thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean the philosophers used to say that everything has a cause, but God is the first cause without a cause. So God is the causer of everything and is not caused by anything. He's Samad. He's self-existing, he's qayyum, he's established. Allah doesn't need anything to establish him. He establishes everything else. And I thought it's very difficult to say that it is existentially independent. So I thought we should think of it as undependence. Something very different from independence. Undependence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not depend on anything else. One day, the Prophet was in the masjid with Ubay ibn Ka'b. And he asked him, said, Ya Abu Munzer, that was his name, nickname, which is the greatest ayah in the Quran? And the companion kept quiet. This was the other of the companions. Even if they knew the answer, they would not answer the Prophet ﷺ when he asked the question for two reasons. One, they assumed that the question was rhetorical. In the sense, the Prophet didn't want to know from this Sahabi which was the greatest ayah in the Quran. He was asking it rhetorically, obviously to make a point. So they were more interested in what he would say subsequently than trying to answer the question. So if you read in the Hadith literature, there are many such traditions in which the Prophet begins a particular lesson by asking a question of a particular companion. So he asks Ubay ibn Kaab, Ya Munzer, which is the greatest ayah in the Quran? And the companion is quiet. And then he asked him the second time, and then he asked him the third time. And on the third time, the companion responds by saying, Ya Rasulullah, it's Ayat al Kursi of the Quran, the verse 255 in Surah Al Baqarah, which I just recited. And the Prophet struck him on his chest and said, I congratulate you on your knowledge of the Quran. Indeed, this is the greatest 
uh, and uh, let me actually tell you exactly what the Prophet said. He says, Ya Munzer, uh, Ya Abdul Munzer, by he in whose hand is my soul, this ayah has a tongue and two lips. This ayah has a tongue and two lips with which she praises the king Allah next to the leg of his throne. It is very interesting if you remember that when the Prophet ﷺ had asked Ubay ibn Khab himself about harf. You remember harf? I talked about it uh, in the lesson on the Quran that there are different types of recitations of the Quran. <coughs> And at that time also he struck Ubay ibn Kaab on his chest and uh, I noticed that Rasulullah seemed to have the style of talking where he would strike. But Daraba Sadri, that's what the hadith says in Arabic. He struck me on my chest. Daraba had. I wish there was more detailed explanation because this seemed to be a very common gesture, Rasulullah. So if any of you ever comes across a more detailed description of what he did, did he tap you, did he hit you, did he push, I mean, what was the exact, I would love to know, that's because this was an important gesture that our Rasulullah made with, with companions which are very close to him, who were like his buddies, this was like a loving gesture of his, he would strike them on their chest and say this. Uh, a very important companion, uh, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, who is buried outside Istanbul. He was 96 when he went uh, to fight the first campaign in Constantinople. One day he came to Rasulullah and the Fajr Salah and said, Ya Rasulullah, I had an interesting encounter last night. A female jinn tried to steal my dates from his house, I guess. And he caught her. He said, I caught her. And I said, I'm going to take you to Rasulullah and he will punish you for stealing. So she started pleading and saying, uh, yeah, you, I'm sorry, let me go, etc. Please, I will not do it again. And so I felt pity for her and I let her go. But the Prophet ﷺ smiled and said, she's a liar. That night, again, she came in and tried to steal his dates and Ayyub al-Sari caught her again and he had this whole encounter with her again. And then she pleaded to him and he let her go. Apparently the Sahabi has a soft heart. He let her go again. And then again in the morning he told her, Ya Rasulullah, I called this female jinn last night. And uh, so the Prophet smiled and said, She lied to you, she will come again. And the third night she did. And he caught her and said, This time I'm not falling to your charms. I will take you to Rasulullah and he will punish you for stealing. So she says, I will teach you something that will keep you safe all the time. Will you let me go if I teach you something that will keep you safe? <coughs> it will keep you safe, your house safe, your property safe, and everything. <coughs> so Ayyubal Ansari thought that, may Allah be pleased with him, that this is a good deal. So he said, yeah, go ahead and teach. So she taught him the Ayatul Kursi. And she said, <coughs> that if you recite the ayat of Kursi, then you will be safe, your property, your house. Next day in the morning, <laughs> he met the Prophet ﷺ again, and obviously Rasulullah was waiting to hear what happened, and he went and reported. And the Prophet responded to him by saying, she is a liar, but in this instant she is correct. If you recite ayat of Kursi at night, before you sleep, you will be safe, your house will be safe, everything will be safe. The same story is repeated in a different tradition. Actually, in multiple traditions narrated by Abu Huraira. Abu, one day the Prophet وسلم, in the month of Ramadan, there were lots of zakat donated to the masjid. They were all collected in the masjid. And the Prophet وسلم, said, Ya Abu Huraira, which means this is the last three years of the Prophet's life. Uh, Abu Huraira met the Prophet وسلم, only in the last three, four years of the Prophet's life. And he said, Ya Abu Huraira, I'm appointing you a guard. Abu Huraira was more or less homeless. He used to live outside the Masjid al Nabi all the time. And the Prophet used to enable him, get him food, etc., from other people. So he was always around Masjid al Nabi. So he said, You are the guard, keep, an, keep guard on this zakat which had been donated to, to the Masjid and we will distribute it later. So that night, Abu Huraira caught a man entering the Masjid and trying to steal the zakat. He was trying to take food. And Abu Huraira caught him and said, First of all, you're a thief. On top of that, you're stealing zakat. The third from the Rasulullah and from the Masjid Nambu, and these are crime upon crime upon crime. And so I'm going to keep you prisoner till Fajr Salah, and when the Prophet comes, 
I will hand you over to him. So he starts pleading and saying, look, I'm very poor. My children are there. I have so many children. I'm very hungry. They are, please let me go. So Abu Hurairah's heart melts, and he lets him go with some food. And in the morning, he meets Rasulullah and says, Ya Rasulullah, this is what happened. The Prophet said, he is a liar and a thief. You should not have let him go. And the next day, the same thing happens. And Abu Huraira then captures this man again and goes through the whole process and he lets him go. And in the morning he tells Ya Rasulullah, it happened again, but I felt, you know, he's saying he's in so many cases, he's hungry, he's poor, etc. So I let them go. And the Prophet said, no, he is a liar. Third night he catches him and tells him, there is no way I'm going to let you go. I'm not falling for your pleadings. So the man says, if you let me go, I will teach you something which will keep you safe all day and all night. So Abu Huraira says, okay, it's a good deal. And so this man teaches Abu Huraira Ayat al Kursi again. And says, at the end of it, Abu Huraira lets him go. In the morning, he comes, the Prophet comes and Abu Huraira and narrates the whole story to him and says, it happened again. And the Prophet smiles and says, yeah, Abu Huraira, I told you that man was a liar. He is a liar. But in this case, he has spoken the truth. And by the way, that was Iblis. So it is a very fascinating tradition. When I read it the first time, I was stunned that even Iblis taught Abu Huraira Ayat al Kursi and said that if you recite Ayat al Kursi in the morning, you are safe until evening. You recite Ayat al Kursi before you sleep and you're safe all night. He said two angels will guard you all night if you recite Ayat al Kursi at night. Now this was taught by Iblis to Abu Huraira. There are two more interesting traditions with regards to this. The Prophet said that he who recites Ayat al Kursi after every Salah, after every Salah, the only thing between him and heaven is death. If you recite Ayat al Kursi after every Salah, the only barrier between the person who does this and have, sorry, heaven is death, which means the moment you die, you will go to heaven, inshallah. Even I didn't know this until recently. I knew about the fact that uh, you recite Ayat al Kursi when you leave home. This is a very common tradition. I've been doing this as a small child. My mother, and my grandmother, and my aunts taught me this. So maybe from first grade onwards, before I sleep, I recite Ayat al Kursi, before I leave home. Even today, when I was driving in the car, I recite Ayat al Kursi. It's a habit, it's automatic. But I didn't know that after Salah, inshallah, I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us all the, the tawfiq to, to, to recite. Ayat al Kursi, make it part, recite it in your dua. It would be even better if you recite the Ayat al Kursi before you say salam. That is the best thing. You must understand that the best dua is in the prayer itself. Why end the prayer? You are closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you are in the state of salah. Sometimes people do a lot of dua after they end their salah. One of the best ways is also to do it in the salah, do it in the sujood. Do it when you're sitting in Jalasa, before you say salam, recite Ayat al Kursi and then say salam, inshallah. Uh, there's another interesting tradition where the Prophet said, Wait, mean, why is this such a great ayat? I mean, that is the question. Why is Ayat al Kursi the greatest of ayat in the Quran? I actually realized it's pretty long. It's longer than Surah Fatiha. I was sitting and counting the words. There are 30 words in Surah Fatiha and there are 50 words in Ayat al Kursi. So the, the greatest ayah in the Quran is longer than the greatest surah in the Quran. Nearly one and a half times longer. The Prophet told uh, Asma anha, that the reason why this could be the greatest ayah is because it, along with the first ayah of Surah Al Imran, those of you who know Alif Lam Mim Allahu La Ilaha. It's the same. Right? So if you read the first ayah of Surah Al Imran and you read the first sentence of Ayat al Kursi, Allahu La Ilaha Illahu La Ilaha they have Ism al Azm, the greatest of names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The greatest of names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Now, some of the commentators have referred to two other ayahs also as <coughs> referring to ayahs which have the greatest of names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those two other ayahs also have al hay al hay and al qayyum al hay and al qayyum in it. These are the two names and sifats of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the 99 names. But the first ayah surah al Imran and the, the first sentence of ayat al Kursi have Allah, the beginning with Allah. There are about 36 ayats in the Quran which begin with Allah, like Allah is Samad. So there are 36 ayats which begin with Allah. These are two of them which begin with Allah. Uh, most of scholars will tell you that the greatest name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Allah. So maybe that is why this ayah is. So let's let's actually break this ayah down and try to understand it in its complexity. So Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Allah la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum. What it really means that Allah, there is no one worthy of worship except Him who is ever living and established. Al Hayy means eternal, who is always living. God always lived. God will always live. The only thing, and it is, you know, when we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we cannot say the only shay in existence or in creation that always existed because the creation did not exist always. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is outside the creation. The creation is a created thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al Qayyum, one who is established by the same way, automatic. Or I, even automatic is probably blasphemous to say. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always exists. He doesn't need anything to exist and he brings things into existence. That's what al Qayyum is about. So this is an important sifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. al Hay is also that he's eternal living. But what is Allah? Allah is the ism of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has many names. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, so on and so forth, right? In the Quran, 99 sifats are mentioned. As-Samad, As-Salam, so on. All of them have an attribute, a particular quality. He is the most merciful. He is ghafur He is often forgiving and he is compassionate. He is al-wudud, he is loving and so on and so forth. So when you invoke the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as al-wudud, you are invoking to his sifa of loving, of his affection. When you say al-latif, you are invoking his, his sifa of subtlety. But the word Allah encompasses all the attributes of all the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which are mentioned in the Quran and not mentioned in the Quran. All beautiful names are Allah's. Not just the ones which are named in the Quran. Only 99 of his names and attributes are mentioned in the Quran. But all the sifats that are there in each of his names, all of those are encompassed in the word Allah. There is an interesting ayah in a different surah, and we find it for you. That that ayah is yes. That ayah is in Surah Al Imran, the ayah number is 65, 1965. It's like a year. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rabbah Samawati wal Ard, ma bainahuma. He is the Lord of the heavens and the earth and whatever is in between them. Fa'abuduhu, so worship him. Wa astabir li ibadatihi. And show patience in worship. This is a very interesting twist. We'll talk about it some other time, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so worship him and show patience in worship. Don't rush. Be patient while you are worshipping. But the key thing that I want to talk about is the next part, which says, Al Talamu Lahu Samia. Do you know? Well, let me try this translation, it's a little difficult. Do you know anyone else whose name is Allah? That is how it is translated. So if you go and look at classical tafsir, uh, if you were a student of tafsir of Quran, and you say, like, you join university, you join Al-Azhar or some respectable madrasa to study and become a mufassir of Quran, the first Quran you come, tafsir you probably start with is Jalal. This is the easiest the most accepted, the most orthodox tafsir of the Quran. Alhamdulillah, it's now available in English. If you have the resources, you should buy it. Sometimes it looks as if it's just paraphrasing the Quran. But even in that, where Jalalain 
just provide simple understanding of the ayat of the Quran, this part of it, Hal A'lamun Lahu Samiyan. I mean, do you know anybody who is like Allah is translated as, do you know anyone whose name is Allah? And what it is saying in conjunction with Allahu la ilaha illa Allahu is that there is nothing or nobody in existence who is called Allah. Only Allah is called Allah. And that is a very important point to make. That, that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is twice in the Quran reference to that there, there is nothing left to us. He does not slumber nor sleep can take him. Slumber or sleep cannot. I, I would recommend that some people move in here, in fact, because I can see lots of brothers coming there. Otherwise, they will keep crossing over. So it's easy to move here, back here, so there is space for people to walk in that area. Uh, now, the, the point it really means is that that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this universe and He is maintaining this creation of His. He's never tired and He never sleeps. This is an important sifat. And one of the differences between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that we sleep. And if you remember from the last time when I spoke to you about death, death is like sleep. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He does not sleep, basically we asserting His character as al hay That's why He does not sleep. Uh, for him, lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi For him is everything that is in heavens and the earth. Obviously, he owns everything. He is Malik Yomidin. He is the Malik of this universe. He created it. Man dalazi yashfau in dahu illa bismi. This is a very interesting phrase. He, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is saying this: Who is it that can intercede without my? Now, an ayah before this, and also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the khana is the day on which nobody can intercede. Khana is a day in which nobody can intercede. And here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, who is it that who can intercede except with my permission? Uh, later on, you will realize, if you read Surah Al-Isra, for example, that Prophet sallallahu is described as someone who can reach maqam al-mahmud. Maqam al-Mahmud is that state which the Prophet ﷺ will achieve where on the day of judgment, with Allah's permission, he will intercede on behalf of his Ummah who believes in La ilaha illallah. So everybody who in their lives believed in La ilaha illallah, the Prophet ﷺ, with the permission of Allah, will intercede. And in a very beautiful hadith, the Prophet ﷺ describes as to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell him that the angels have failed, they cannot intercede. I want you to intercede. And when the Prophet ﷺ will prostrate in front of him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will let the Prophet ﷺ remain in sujood for a long time. And as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pleases. And then after a long time has passed, he will tell the Prophet ﷺ, now we can intercede on behalf of people. And the Prophet ﷺ will first intercede on behalf of his ummah, then will also intercede on behalf of others. And we'll also intercede on behalf of people who have already been sent to hell and actually get them out, uh, except one group of people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forgive uh, to be consistent with Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Uh, this ayah, yeah, uh, this part of the ayah, Ya alamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma khalfahum wa la yumituna bi shayin min ilmi. This is a very important ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that he knows what is before them and what is behind them. And there's a lot of discussion in classical explanation of what, uh, what this actually means. Uh, you must understand that the general understanding is when you say, uh, for example, when you say, Baina yadihi, in front, in between his two hands, which means it's in front of you, Khalfa whom is behind you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is the past and he knows what is the future. He knows what is in this world and he knows what is in Alam al -Ghayt. He knows what will happen before the Day of Judgment. He will know what will happen after the Day of Judgment. He knows what we manifest. He knows what we keep secret. So he knows what is inside our hearts and he knows what is outside us. So basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says that he knows 
what is in between the two hands in front and behind says he knows everything else. But this is very interesting and he says, Vala yuhituna vishayin min ilmi. But he does not let anybody know anything from among his ilm except illa bimasha, except that which he wills. Now, it's simple, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not allow us to learn anything about him except what he allows us to learn. Now it seems very simple, but it is very important because this is the justification for Sharia. There are people who are philosophers and people who are rationalists who say we can un understand what is good and what is bad using our aqal. Yes, you can understand that taking drugs is bad using our aqal. You can understand that committing a crime is bad, but you cannot understand that Ayatul Kursi is the best ayah of the Quran using your aqal. So what? Scholars like Ibn Arabi and others said that this part of Ayat al Kursi says that we need the Sharia to, to gain khurba or close proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will never be able to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the procedure to get close to Him. How do we get? And this is what it is. This is the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will share with us. Without it, that is why revelation is necessary and reason is insufficient. This is an important part of that ayah. Was the akursiyus samawati wal ard? Some people have taken this literally. It means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's throne covers everything from the heavens to the earth. But what others have said that perhaps kursi here does not literally mean his throne or his chair, but it means his knowledge or his providence or his sovereignty. So basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that he holds sway. This English word is much better than translating. He holds sway over everything which is in the heaven and the earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the protection of both of this, his zahumah, the protection of both of this does not tire him. Wahual Ali Lazim. He is the greatest and he is the most high. This is an important prayer. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives us the tawfiq to recite Ayatul Kursi before we sleep, recite Ayatul Kursi as soon as we get up. Make it a habit. As soon as you get up, take the shahada. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. You become a Muslim again. And then recite Ayatul Kursi and then go towards Fajr Salah. And after you finish with your stuff at night, do your wudu, take shahada again, recite Ayatul Kursi again and go to sleep. But also make it a point to recite Ayatul Kursi as often as you can in the Salah or immediately after every Salah. Inshallah, there will be no barrier between you and heaven except, except the death. And that, like I said before, is not something that we should be worried about. Alhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulullah. I normally, I do a lot of politics in real life, so I try to keep politics out of the khutbah. I don't want to do politics on the day that I'm talking about the greatest ayah in the Quran, but unfortunately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also told us that one way of being muttaqi, one way of being a true believer is to stand up for justice, to speak for power. So I'm going to ask you to do something. Uh, there is a deal the nuclear deal with Iran, which has been signed after a long time. The tensions between Iran and the United States have had a huge impact on Muslim lives in the U.S. The beginning of modern Islamophobia in the United States started with 1979. You find poor Sikhs are killed because they wear turbans and beards because they look like Khomeini and Bin Laden. So this perception in American mind of Islamophobia began with the Iranian revolution in 1979 and the hostages that the Iranians held for about 400 days. So now President Obama is on the verge of putting an end to this conflict. And it's very important that it does. It will have a stabilizing effect in, in, in the Middle East. Iran will not have to continue to play the role of the spoiler to attack, attract attention. It will become part of the mainstream. It will benefit economically, technologically, etc. But there are lots of people in this country who are trying to make sure that the Congress decides to reject this deal. Vote probably in the Congress will be around 15 to 17th of September. President Obama has promised to veto even if the Congress passes the rejection. 
But what it means really is this, that Republicans control both the houses. So Obama needs, in order to be able to veto it successfully, needs one of the two houses not to reach two-thirds majority. And the best chance he has is in the U.S. Senate. In the United States Senate, there are 44 Democratic senators. If 34 of them vote no on the proposal to reject the deal, the deal will pass because Obama will reject it. Even if Republicans get 66 yes votes in the Senate, Obama will reject the veto. It will change. It is a very important bill. Unfortunately, Netanyahu is lobbying hard. He's constantly talking to Jewish groups and he's pushing them very hard. Nearly $100 million are being spent in the last four weeks to influence. There are, so far, there are 44 Democratic senators. All the Republicans needed 11 Democratic senators to defect. Two have already defected, Senator Chuck Schumer of New York and Menendez of New Jersey. So they need nine more senators, of which only 20 have said that they will support Obama. So there are about 20 still in play. And one of the senators who is in play is Chris Coons, who is our senator, who took our money, who took our vote, who talked with us. So what I want you to do is to, as soon as possible today or tomorrow, call Chris Coons and tell him that he represents us and we want him to support our president. We elected Obama to make our foreign policy. We didn't elect Netanyahu to make our foreign policy. So we want Chris Coons to support Obama in making a historical peace with the Muslim world. We are tired of wars with the Muslim world. If the Americans reject this deal, the rest of the world will still go ahead and make peace with Iran, forcing the US to go to war. So a no vote on this I mean, if, if Chris Kuhn's votes to reject the Iran bill, Iran treaty, that means he's also voting indirectly for a future war with Iran. So we have sheets of paper outside on which we have Chris Kuhn's, all the three numbers, for Wilmington office, for Delaware office, so please call him. I also have put in talking points there. So take the sheet, just read what's there on it, call. But let them know that you are from yeah. Delaware. So far, so far, the phone calls that Chris Kuhn's office has been getting are four is to one. Four is to one, which means 80% of all the phone calls are demanding that he reject the Iran bill. And only 20% are saying his support. On the 1st or 2nd of September, the Delaware Muslim Council will have a public discussion of this event. We are planning to do that. We'll try and see if we can get Chris Kuhn's to come. Yesterday in the morning, Chris Kuhn's went and spoke at the Jewish community center with support, with APAC in attendance, etc. We would like him to come here. We may not have that much money, but we have the votes, inshallah. And we will remember five years from now when the time comes to work. It's very important for us to do this. This is how we become citizens. A lot of us complain about the system not working for us. But if you don't participate in the system, then you don't have the right to complain also. So first participate and then complain. So please take that sheet outside with the phone numbers, call Senator Coons and tell him very clearly that do not reject the bill. Support President Obama in making peace. Just as he made peace with Cuba, we want him to make peace with Iran, inshallah. <laughs>
الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم ملك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات ولا ولا يؤده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم الله الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم ملك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا
ông bố ông bố ông bố ông bố ông bố ông bố Allah. 